Hello, welcome to Sunday Science Q&A. Welcome to Easter Sunday Science Q&A. For those of uh, you, uh, happy Easter. Uh, for those of you who, who are Easter people, for those of you who are chocolate people, happy... Uh, well, it, it's already getting, to be honest, my son made some brownies, which the contents of which is almost, you know, when you go, this is instant diabetes. This is the speed of travel journey towards diabetes. Uh, very, very dense. Uh, so I hope you're all still feeling fine. Uh, and uh, we're joined this fantastic panel today. In fact, I think... I think he was on the very, as far as I remember, the very first one of these that we did just over a year ago, uh, which is uh, Brian Green is joining us again. And uh, we have Clara Nellis, who's not been with us before, but you may well have heard on the Uncanny Hour, uh, John Carpenter, uh, Double Bill that we did a while ago. And obviously we have Helen with us as well. Uh, I quickly go through a few things to tell you. One is uh, thank you very much. Anyone who supports us via Patreon, if you are able to support us via Patreon and don't as yet, that will be fantastic. It's especially in the last year being the the way that we've managed to keep making things and can kind of surviving and so things like uh, the tips for existence series which is available to anyone who's a patron supporter in fact brian did the first one of those as well and he's always a pioneer for us brian Green. he's always right at the start and uh, we also have episodes with tim minchin and the latest one is sarah parkak who's a fantastic space archaeologist we've got andrean coming up uh neil gaiman and uh did i mention tim minchin i can't remember if i mentioned him. i mentioned him twice he deserves it he's a good guy and uh also uh, nick Stop, which was a, a lot of fun, who's uh, uh, an earthling, an artist, an astronaut. Uh, also to mention on a couple of other things, which is uh, the current book shambles is Ginny Smith and Melanie Challenger. Both of them are books which look at different ideas of, of what it means to be human and to be an animal and to be human and about nature of our brain. And uh, there's also a free online event uh, with the Royal Institution on April the 27th celebrating Ernest Rutherford as well uh which will be uh i think we've got john butterworth joining us for that and helen will be there and me so you can see that uh tweet questions uh to at cosmic shambles or just put them in the live chat and trent will send them to me and uh next week uh, we're back doing more dinosaurs because we never run out of questions to be honest we don't normally run out of questions on the universe generally but dinosaurs in particular there are still many questions to be answered so we'll be joined by uh susie maidman and riley black next sunday so so first of all, let's go over to Helen. Hello, Helen. Happy Hello. Easter, etc. Happy, happy spring. Yes, spring all right. It does actually feel like spring. It's clear these guys are around today. So I've got a bit of Scientist Week from history to start us all off. And it's I'd like you to wind your minds back to 1932 in the Cavendish Laboratory. And the thing that one of the two well there were two big things that happened that year at the Cavendish uh, one was that the neutron was discovered by Chadwick but in April that year only by April this is the second thing that happened um, John Cockcroft and Ernest Walton split the atom and this was a really significant moment um, for lots of reasons it was uh, the first clear experimental demonstration in this way of mass and energy being equivalent um, it was the first sort of particle accelerator type experiment using so they had they had lithium and they were chucking uh, protons at it and uh, the lithium then split added a proton turned into two alpha particles and they were actually looking at these looking at the the um the alpha particles hit a screen and they were looking for the little bright spots as these alpha particles came on the screen so this was a, it was a big bit of science and so i've got sort of connections to this i did my um uh, PhD in the Cavendish and the original experimental equipment was still there when I was there and uh, also the son of Ernest Walton was in my lab he was Alan Walter and he's the one who started the bubble work and he's the reason I it, by a long chain of other things that I got into bubbles anyway back to the splitting the atom so um, this was in Ernest Rutherford's time so he had moved from Manchester to the Cavendish laboratory so he was in charge of the lab he was an experimentalist uh, Cockcroft was the theorist and they sort of there was this, this wonderful combination of a theorist and an experimentalist who just kind of got stuck in. They used um, exper like uh, technical expertise from Manchester, from Metrovic, who had been uh, were building electronic widgets. So there was an industrial collaboration in there as well. And they knew as soon as they saw it, basically they saw these spots. They knew they were alpha particles. They wrote a sort of three hundred word letter to Nature which is apparently what you did back then. Uh, and they got the Nobel Prize for it in 1951 because that was basically the start of particle accelerators. And, and John Cockcroft then went on to be instrumental in, in CERN and other big experiments. He was master of one of the colleges in Cambridge, all that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, it's just, it's just one of those little things that 
it, it's such a small experiment by itself that it almost got overtaken later on. But that was the beginning of, of people realising that it was definitely right. They were almost sure, but it was like, that was it. Now we've done it. And it opens the door to all these other things. So, yeah, that ni- next year will be the 90th anniversary of the discovery of the first time the atom was split intentionally. Fantastic. And I'm sure we'll probably do a variety based show around that as we normally do on <laughs> such an event. Uh, and joined by uh, Brian Green as well. Brian, I should well, mention, Brian, by, I the should way, mention book, by the way, his I know book, I've mentioned I know. a lot on this show because it was one of my favourite books of last year. Until the End of Time is out now in paperback in the UK as well. And it is a really, it's, it's, it, uh, I, uh, it, that, that book and uh, The End of Everything by Katie Matt were my two favourite, definitely my two favourite science books last year and in my top five books. Wonderful. Um, Brian, thank you very much for joining us. Good morning to you because you're in New York. Um, you. I know you've got a show and tell, I think, for us. I do. I do. God, God that's, uh, uh, was I supposed to bring something to show and tell? Oh, no, I thought you did have one. If you don't, it doesn't matter. No, I mean, I can uh, try to work. Can, a, hey, I don't want to disappoint. The book. The book, wait, wait, let me look. <laughs> look, I'm home. I may have stuff. You know, well, hang on. You want if I get up, I get something for you. These are the best kinds of shows and tells when people just go, oh, what, what have I got hanging around? <laughs> it, it's like with Alice Roberts. If you, if you ever surprise that, she just opens a drawer and it turns out it's just filled with fossils and skulls. I have something. I actually do have something. Next time you got to warn me. Uh, or maybe you did warn me. I didn't get the warning. Uh, but this is, can you see this? Yes. yes. Can it's you like, see inside like, of it? It's, oh, no. this, uh, yes. it's a glass etching of a Calabia manifold. So inside the br- again, I have no idea what you can actually see on the screen because of the lighting and so we forth. We can see but- the shape, yeah. Yeah. So within there, this is a, a six-dimensional vanishing first Turing class complex manifold that may be one of the forms for the extra dimensions of string theory. And it's been etched in glass, and I forget who made it, but they sent it to me, and it's kind of this beautiful piece of art that may actually reflect what the extra dimensions of the universe look like. But it looks different from every side. It's a yeah, it does look different from every side because what you're doing is you're taking a three-dimensional slice through a six-dimensional manifold, and then you're projecting it into this environment. And so from the different angles, you'll catch different parts of that three-dimensional slice on a two-dimensional plane. So that kind of gives you a sense of it. Can I ask so, you? So I- have, I, have I passed? Yeah, you passed. Do you know what? I, I may well have misread the email that Trent sent me. It might have actually said, Clara and Brian don't have a show and tell, <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't end up reading all of it. But I, I'm always interested in this, and I think we might have talked about it before, but about your imagination when you... Uh, because I know with different physicists, there are some who will say they do have a visual imagination in terms of when they're, they're thinking, especially beyond the dimensions that we feel that we experience. Yeah. And others it feels that they they would normally say they see the equations, they see numbers in their head. From your experience, what do you get a sense in, in, in your imagination? So I'm much more of the mathematical orientation to things, and I think I'm common in this regard. I take the math, I get lower dimensional analogs of the higher dimensional spaces, sort of like the visualization that we have there, but even usually simple. I usually think in two dimensions, not in three dimensions and use that as a guide, but ultimately it's the mathematics that's the determinant consideration in figuring out what's right and what's wrong. But look, there are other people who do this differently. I mean, there's this um, famous mathematician, Thurston, I believe is the story, and he was teaching a class on, on higher dimensional geometry to his students, and they looked baffled as he was talking about whatever six dimensional shapes and apparently he walked to the corner of the room and thought for a moment and then turned back and said aha i know why you're all so confused it's so much easier to visualize this all in 12 dimensions (laughs) you know so so you know is that apocryphal is that actually you know i don't know but but there are those who really say they have the capacity to see things in higher dimensions I don't really have that capacity. It's there's such some really a... interesting examples, aren't there? Because those are knitting hyperbolic surfaces. So there are there are ways of giving you at least a hint of what it means. Anyone but who I think hint hyperbolic but, knitting, look it up. It's very clever. But hint is the operative word there because all because of these are, all of these are representations in our three dimensional world in some way, shape, or form. I mean, like this thing over here, right? I mean, this is obviously a three-dimensional object that we can hold and we can touch. Imagining something beyond that 
in four or five, six dimensions and beyond, it's hard to see how you would do that. Now, I will say one thing, we've created a virtual reality experience where you go into the virtual world and you do create four, five, six dimensional hyper seers and hyper cubes, you know, tesseracts and hepteracts and things, hexeracts and things of that sort. But again, it is a visual representation brought down to a three dimensional environment, even though it can give you a visceral sense of things, it's still not really higher dimensions. We need to do something about do something them. about that because the human imagination, even just going to, to the, with John Higgs a while ago, talking with him about his new book about William Blake. And I forget the term. Trent will probably send it to me. But the, about the different levels of visual imagination that people have anyway, that, for instance, a lot of artists or certainly a reasonable number of, have very little actual internal imagination. And it's a fascinating thing when you discover, which is the imagination is in granite or on canvas and and the the idea that we all have roughly the same amount going on in terms of what our visual imagination it seems there's a lot of research to show there's a huge disparity and sometimes a lack of visual imagination does not mean a lack of artistry or indeed a, a, a lack of being able to then journey into different dimensions yeah but i will yeah, find then out you should also know that yeah. You, you're probably familiar, with that, probably cubism. familiar with that cubism. I mean, when Picasso was pioneering a new way of, of, of visualizing the world, some people have analyzed it as seeing in the fourth dimension because in four dimensions, you take a three-dimensional object and you'd see two orientations on it simultaneously that would not be available to a three-dimensional being. So when you sort of see an individual or a shape depicted on the canvas from two different orientations, in a sense, that is representing four dimensions. So there've been people who've studied this. I don't know, I've never been all that convinced that the link between the art and the science was sufficiently tight to claim that they were part of the same discovery. People like to say maybe Picasso and Einstein, they were discovering the same thing just you know, from the art world and the physics world. I love the way it sounds. It's beautiful poetry. Metaphorically, maybe there's something there. I, I don't know that I'm convinced, but it certainly is an interesting parallel between the two. I would certainly recommend that John Higgs's other book, Stranger Than We Can Imagine, which rather than that basically says that goes through a lot of 20th century arts reaction to the change of the understanding of the possibilities of the universe rather than uh, uh, initially from the, that, that point of, uh, of ingenious creativity. Ingenious creativity. Clara, hello. Um, hello. I find now out I whether, find I, out misread whether the I misread e the email. Clara, do you have a show and tell for us? I do have a show and tell. Now, of course, that you could Lagging just that. be because you've known for at least five <laughs> minutes now and you've rushed around your room while I wasn't looking. I mean, it genuinely is from the room, but I've had it down here uh, <laughs> next to me. So I brought the front cover of the New York Times from the day after the Higgs boson was announced. And there's a bit of a story. Um, so I was a PhD student at the time when this was uh, the presentation was happening. And I slept outside of the auditorium with my fellow PhD student friends so that we could get to the back of the auditorium. And then I have to remember where I am. So that <laughs> little set of pixels, I don't know if you see it on the screen, is my face <laughs> on, in the back of the auditorium cheering the result. So that was the moment uh, that we got to share with the world that we discovered the Higgs boson. And you knew before you, I mean, you knew why you were sleeping outside, presumably, did you? Yeah. So I knew the Atlas result, but not all of the details. Um, but I didn't know what CMS had found. But I knew that if we were going to be having such a big fanfare, that it was, it was good news. So we need to check, though, because I mean, you can give us that anecdote. But, but have what else? else have you slept out the night before you know glastonbury tickets new trainers you know i need to just check because it might turn out you're someone who just likes any kind of opportunity to sleep outside <laughs> waiting for some kind of revelation so the only other time i've slept outside for tickets or something See, was uh, david tennant and patrick stewart in hamlet um huh? in uh, stratford that's a I, very highbrow ticket, tip sleeping outside for tickets. <laughs> yeah, I was a stu again a student at the time and they had five pound tickets if you were one of the first 10 people to get there. So it how was, was it? It was great. It was fantastic. Yeah. He is a, a, a friend of mine who goes to a lot of theatre and has 
for many years. She'll, she says, Patrick Stewart is the greatest theatre actor she's ever seen. And I remember the joy of, we, he was on uh, Infinite Monkey Cage quite a few series ago. And uh, we had, uh, so Monica Grady had brought a piece of meteorite, which is the, the fascinating bit when you feel it and it has a density to it, which is so unexpected as it's passed to you. Mm. And I remember being fascinated. By, and then, of course, Patrick Stewart brought out his communicator badge. And that's when everyone went, ooh, <laughs> including Brian Cox. And I was going, but that's just a thing that got made in Burbank. There's hundreds of those. This is this is meaty. No, but this is from Star Trek. And it's nice when you see those moments. Um, we have some wonderful questions. I'm going to start with a question from Paige, who is seven years old. Uh, hello, Paige. Uh, now, Paige wants to know, how is gravity strong enough to keep everything on the ground? And this is such, you know, that that idea that gravity is the weakest force and yet is, is much. So, Brian, if I can start with you on that. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question and one that deserves a lot of attention because, as, as you say, Robin, gravity intrinsically is very weak. And the way we demonstrate that to students all the time is, you know, we grab something and we, and we lift it, right? So the earth is pulling on this with gravity, yet my puny little muscles, I'm not a strong guy, my puny muscles are able to overcome the pull of the earth's gravity and lift this object upwards. So yeah, gravity is intrinsically quite weak, but it compensates in our environment because the earth is huge. So because the earth is huge and every part of the earth pulls on every part of you, Paige, of me, of everything else in the world around us, and the collective pulls of every molecule and every atom in the earth is just enough to keep everything anchored to the surface of the planet. Now, everything is a big word. There are things that do escape, right? The outer atmosphere molecules can get knocked out of our vicinity if they're hit hard enough. We know that if we launch rockets, if their engines are strong enough, they can escape the pull of the earth's gravity. So it's that there's a lot of earth taking all these little pulls and it's enough to keep the familiar things around us anchored to the surface. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Paige. I hope that if you, if you want to know any more, you just send us another question. Maybe uh, I can, in... maybe I can oh, ask yes, quickly. Uh, so just, one thing that we don't know about gravity is how it interacts with antimatter. Um, and so we're actually doing some experiments at CERN, and we just had a big breakthrough last week for one of them uh, on being able to measure whether gravity actually pulls antimatter or whether perhaps it repels it. And this is a really interesting question because we assume that it will act exactly the same, but until we do the measurement, we don't know for sure. So it's it's an interesting study. I'm going to guess that it pulls do. it. Yeah, I mean, that's where my money would be. Um, but it, <laughs> it's still important that we we do the measurements because we know that there must be a difference between matter and antimatter somewhere. And so we're trying to to find that that difference. Also, you've got to do so. Also, you've got to do something with CERN. You've built all that stuff. I mean, you've got to come up with some experiments, haven't you? Yeah. Um, this is uh, now traveling back in time. And I think this may well come from some rather strange things that have been said about uh, vaccination recently. But uh, this question is, uh, I think I think it is just uh, A.S. Bridges says, um, can traveling back in time be possible uh, for nano sized things? So start with you, Clara, Clara on that one. For, for particles, we differentiate don't, different. the, the direction of time. Um, so processes that can happen in one direction can also happen in the other direction. Um, but whether or not they can travel directly through time, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's not something that we can do at the moment. Brian, I don't know. Did you see that there was this, this stuff going this, around? This stuff going around on social media about the the nanoparticles in, or they were called nanoparticles for some reason. I don't know if that they, uh, uh, it, in uh, uh, the vaccines, and it was kind of a conspiracy theory. So, so is is this something which has started from a possible misunderstanding of something which might be kind of true in, within the laws of physics? Well, I the think the point that Clara makes is a, is a good one, and I think it can be the source of the confusion. So it is the case that when we look at our deepest understanding of the laws of physics, for the most part, they don't distinguish between forward in time and backward in time in the sense that any event that you take a film of, if you run the film in reverse, that reverse process is compatible with the laws of physics. 
So there is a kind of symmetry in that sense, but that's quite different from actually traveling back in time. We're talking about processes that unfold in one orientation or in the reverse temporal orientation, but they're all going toward the future. Talking about actually traveling, you know, 100 years or 10 years or even a millisecond into the past is a, is a completely different question. And it's not a settled question. We can travel to the future at arbitrary rates. So time travel to the future is absolutely part of Einstein's relativity. There's no question about that. Any physicist that knows anything they're talking about agrees with that statement. But traveling to the past, people have made proposals, their papers, scholarly papers that have been written using things like wormholes or cosmic strings or, or exotic kinds of matter. But I would say that most of us suspect that when we understand the laws of physics more fully, travel to the past will likely be ruled out. Well, wasn't there that great experience you sent an invitation to the future? Mm. He said, I'm having a party. And he specified yeah. the date and the time. And he said, anyone from the future is very welcome to turn up to my party. And nobody came. <laughs> Which is a brilliant thing, because in principle... If anybody, if any future human civilization invents time travel and they got the invitation, presumably they would have turned up. And so it was a very nice experiment. <laughs> yeah, but what if there were a load of other parties from exactly. other physicists across time? And, you know, <laughs> and, and this is the, yeah, so it could be that thing that there's so many clever physicists saying, well, I'm going to have a party from anyone for the future. They go, my diary is just packed. Even though time itself has become more tangible, it's a real problem thing, thing in all these social engagements. Um, now, there's another explanation too, Robin, that's worth mentioning, which is in the proposals for, proposals for time travel to the past that have been made, in, in all of them, you can't travel to a moment in the past before the first time machine was created, whether it's a wormhole or something more exotic. So it could be the case that we've yet to create the first of these time travel to the past devices, and therefore the time travelers, the would-be time travelers to the future couldn't get back to Stephen Hawking's moment because a time machine was not in existence at that point in time. Public transport never goes where you want when you want it, does it? Exactly. So it is kind of, you know, the, the, the a freeway. It doesn't exist yet. You can't take that route now, but there might be a point where you can. Anyway, the basic thing is none of these things that we've mentioned are any reason not to have uh, any of the vaccines that have been tested for COVID-19. Right? Uh, the um, Now, this is uh, Nick uh, would like to know. I'm going to uh, ask you this, Clara. Uh, it says, uh, does the LHC make a cool noise when you turn it on? I'm really sorry to disappoint people when they ask this question because it doesn't make a cool noise well, and at all. The beam itself is in a vacuum, so we don't get any sound from the LHC beam itself. Uh, and if you were in the tunnel, which I really don't recommend because it's it's a very dangerous place to be while we're running due to the radiation levels, uh, then you would just hear the electronic noise of the machine and some of the pumps for the cooling. So, I mean, that that's kind of a sci-fi-y sound, but it's not, you don't hear like a, a whirring or you don't get to hear the collisions as they as they collide. You do need to but work on that. Add sound effects. So we, we have sound effects in some of the control rooms. So some of the different <laughs> settings have sound effects so everybody knows what's happening at that time, but uh, they're completely added later. See, because I do imagine, go, we're about to turn the machine on. Switch on the Doctor Who theme tune from 1972. Because it's like the, there was a, a the, the Booker Mat, which I've talked about before on this, which is in Monkey's Paw Bookshop in Toronto. And they basically have a big machine that they've made and they give you a token and you put it in and then it goes chugga, 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 and a book drops out. And you find out it's them getting rid of some of their rubbish books and it has a bit of novelty. But they found out in the original version it just didn't seem effective because what they've added is when the book falls, it then goes ting. And they found the addition of a ting brought far more results in terms of at least purchases. Uh, I don't know how much it would help with physics. Um, is, it, right. is it not true that ATMs have a noise of them sorting the notes before they give you the note and that's added it? This might be completely false, so somebody please tell me if it's not true. The ATMs make that worry noise so that you trust that they're counting your money before they give it to you and they don't actually have to make that noise at all. But I could have made that up. It's something I had. I don't it would know. be Somebody that. I love out. that. Yeah, <laughs> anyone knows that. Uh, it would be lovely if they had different machines. So one of them just went, hang on a minute. One, two, three. Yeah, that's a, <laughs> this is, uh, well, we'll find out before the end of the show, I hope. Uh, question for you, Brian, from Christopher. Uh, 
he wants to, now this is quite a big one i suppose which is how is time a physical thing well yeah it is a it is a big yeah, one it is a, it is a big one and i don't know if i'm going to give a particularly satisfying answer because i'm of the opinion that we don't quite know the answer to that question yet time certainly is part of our equations the equations that you learn in school always have a T in it. Newton's equations have time in it. Quantum mechanics, there's a variable called T in those equations representing time. The general theory of relativity has time in it. So time is intricately woven within our fundamental equations of the world. But is that simply because we human beings organize our perceptions of reality using this temporal sense and therefore, when it comes to finding laws of physics, we're biased toward laws that incorporate that temporal quality. Or is it that time's truly fundamentally woven into the fabric of reality? And nobody knows the answer to that question. And in fact, there are hints in string theory, you know, the theory that tries to put our understanding of all the laws of physics together into one, one structure. There are hints in string theory that time itself may be made up of more fine, more fundamental ingredients, right? We're used to, you take a piece of wood, we know it's made up of molecules. If you go far enough down, molecules, atoms, and electrons, and the neutrons, protons, quarks, right? That's all familiar to anybody who studies the most basic of physics. Could it be the time, maybe space as well, have a similar quality that they're made up of kind of molecules of time or atoms of time or ingredients of time. And were that the case, you could imagine realms of the universe where those ingredients have not come together in the right pattern to yield time as we know it. And so in those parts of the universe, there might be a kind of pre-time quality, some er time, some more microscopic version of time that would be completely unfamiliar to us who've only experienced sort of the macroscopic, effective version of time. So these are ideas that people struggle with, and we, as yet, really don't know the answer. See, that's the thing that I, I found to Carlos Frank when he started to explain to me that I, uh, one of the many things I knew nothing about, which is when we talk about, is it 10 to the minus 37 now, that, that bit of the universe that we don't really know? I, I, I'm never up to date with whether it's minus 36 or minus 38 or minus... Well, in, in space, in space, it's about 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. In time, it's about 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Those are the, the Planck values where you're at such a small interval of time, such a small distance in space that conventional ideas may go away. You see, that's the bit that I'd never really thought, which is it's not looking, but he said, it's not necessarily looking at that amount of time when we see that 10 to the minus 43, because as you were just saying, time itself, as it is at that point where we have two different, you know, the two theories that do not mesh together, that theory of everything, th then we're not necessarily talking about time as we know it. And once you get that in your head, you go. So he says it could have been ages, but ages in a different sense of ages. And that's when your mind starts to, uh, I find anyway, implode. Yeah. Um, the uh, uh, Clara, this is as you know. I'll ask Helen for you. This is a bubble question. Uh, Maria would like to know. Uh, Helen has talked about measuring bubbles at sea. How does this work? How do you physically measure a bubble under the ocean? Uh, it's actually really difficult, which is one of the reasons I have a job because you'd think <laughs> that measuring bubbles was something, you know, in this talking about particle colliders and all of these things, you'd think it was something that had been done a long time ago. And it hasn't because the world is a very messy place and most of the bubbles we're talking about get formed out in the open ocean. So you're a long way from uh, shore. They're in waves. So the, the surface of the ocean is going up and down a lot and the bubbles are going up and down with it. And bubbles are generally the big ones quite short lived and they're formed at the surface and it's actually hard to be there without creating your own bubbles so it's hard to fight so it's hard to detect bubbles without being intrusive basically and spoiling the experiment so what i do there's, there's basically a range of techniques you can do it using sound because bubbles are squishy so water is generally very incompressible if you go all the way down to the deepest parts of the ocean almost you know, 10 kilometers down, enormous weight of water. The water gets smaller, it's squeezed by 5%. It can resist an enormous pressure. So basically water is incompressible. But as soon as you put little pockets of gas in it, it basically becomes spongy, springy almost. Um, and if you send sound through water, you're basically compressing the water. And so bubbles make water very suddenly springy. And so you can detect um, 
the way bubbles scatter and absorb uh, sound. So you can do it via sound. You can take photographs of them. People have tried using holography and things like that. Um, I do it using a combination of sound and cameras, and you can use sonar as well. So basically, it's either sound or light. The hard bit is getting those instruments into the right place in the middle of a massive, great big storm without spoiling, without because if anything splashes against them, then you've just made a load of bubbles and it all goes wrong. So I'm actually just I'm writing a proposal for the next time I go to sea and thinking about all of these things. And the, the problem is the problem doesn't get any easier because however clever your technology is, you still got to get to this really awkward position in the ocean in the top meter below the surface when water weighs tons and everything's being chucked around all over the place and it doesn't matter how swanky your camera is if it doesn't stand up to being smashed by tons and tons of water you've got a problem so so it's it's pretty much sound and light but the, that's not the hard bit the hard bit is getting into the right place and doing it without being intrusive it's really interesting I think brilliant thank you um now here's another big question for you clara this is from diane diane says if the higgs, if the higgs gives particles mass what gives the higgs mass is the higgs a field that creates mass or is it a thing with mass itself if so what gives that mass basically why is there mass at all so this is, so a, this a, great is a, a great question so the the mass for all fundamental particles and by that i mean particles that cannot be broken down into any smaller pieces that we know of um, they get their mass from interacting with the Higgs field. So not with the Higgs boson itself, but with interacting with the field. And this is a field that permeates throughout the whole universe, and it has a non-zero value, which it makes it quite interesting. Um, so the Higgs boson itself is the, heel, the field interacting with itself and creating sort of a fluctuation, and that's a, a particle with mass. Um, so... The reason that we got so excited when we discovered the Higgs boson was because it told us that the Higgs field existed. It was sort of a, a way that we could connect to that field. So it's mass and it's, it's how the Higgs boson itself gets mass. Wonderful. Thank you, Diane. I hope that has answered that for you. Is, uh, right, we're going to have a question from Carl, and I'll throw this to you, Brian, first of all. Carl recently stumbled on the idea of space time foam if i understand it correctly he says which i almost certainly don't there may be self-contained universes within quantum bubbles i wondered what helen and brian thought about this so we'll start we'll get to the bubble question in a minute helen but brian starting off with you. so is space time foam is that the same as what is described as quantum foam quantum foam oh uh, so the word is foam f-o-a-m foam so yes sorry that, foam yeah yeah uh, I, I, I don't know. I think that they are. I've only encountered that word in one setting, which is when you look at space time on, on very small scales, quantum mechanics starts to matter. And in quantum mechanics, we've learned that particles can fluctuate in and out of existence. Things that you thought would have a unique value can actually oscillate, jitter between multiple values. And when you apply that idea to the fabric of space time itself, it means space time that you might have thought as some thing like a fabric is actually itself undulating and jittering and has wild oscillations on on tiny scales which gives it a foam like character and so space time foam quantum foam are words that we use to describe the nature of space time when quantum mechanics matters on very small scales and so in terms of this idea that there would be uh, uh, self-contained universes within quantum bubbles. Um, well, since it's a bubble question, I'm going to throw this to uh, Helen. So. <laughs> I knew you were good. <laughs> this is right, Helen. You have 30, you have 30 seconds. Bubbles. Whatever they are, they're not bubbles. So, um, so the, I think the, one of the things that's really interesting about this is that there's a very there's actually quite a sketchy idea of what a bubble is but it's a nice friendly word that you can attach to other things that might that might sort of pop into existence and so it's this word that gets used quite like i get emails from people going oh i've discovered the universe is made of 37 big bubbles and you're right okay one of those um and and so i think the problem is that people use the word bubble because it sounds friendly and it sounds clever at the same time and it's not really helpful you need to be more specific about what you're talking about for it to mean anything so bubbles is a kind of jargon a non-jargon word almost in this case which people use when they want to sound like that it's i've got a be a right bee in my bonnet about jargon because jargon is the point where people stop thinking but it's like it's jargon when you've missed out the step of it actually meaning anything uh, which gets my goat even more than the other type of jargon <laughs> so yeah so i think the problem is whenever you hear that description that bubbles if it, it needs a more specific description otherwise it, it's it might be just 
I'm trying to think of a nice word, pseudoscience. Not a bubble. Right, so there's a lot of work to be done in this area then. That's what we've done. Uh, this is from uh, Greenfields56. Uh, start with you on this, Clara, which is um, how flexible is the standard model? For example, if these new measurements at CERN are correct, do we simply add stuff to the standard model or do we have to rethink the entire thing? So the standard well, model is, is annoyingly correct. So we've been trying for a very long time to break it or to find uh, cracks in it because we know that it doesn't it doesn't explain everything that we observe in the universe. It doesn't explain to us why there's more matter than antimatter in our universe. It doesn't tell us what dark matter is. It doesn't have gravity in it at all. Um, so we know already that it's an incomplete model. And so after discovering the Higgs boson, what we've really been trying to do at CERN is to break the standard model or to find something beyond it that gives us a hint of what else is out there. Um, so if this, these measurements at LHCb are correct, then we would add to the standard model and it would become a bigger picture uh, because there would be something else out there that's not explained in the standard model. Brilliant. Could you just, for anyone who's not sure what the standard model is, could you just uh, uh, explain what, what it is? Yeah, it's essentially a, a recipe book of, of how uh, particles work, um, so which particles we have and how they interact with each other. Um, so it can be written, and unfortunately I don't have my t-shirt with it on, um, so it can be written in quite a short equation form, but then you can expand upon that and get a lot of information about particles and forces uh, from it. Um, so yeah, it's essentially a recipe book that we follow for the particles and forces that we have. Wonderful, thank you. Now I'm going to put two two, two questions. questions together here, uh, which is um, one question, which is from uh, Rose, who just says, "This is a quick and easy one. Is there a scientific definition of reality?" Um, and uh, I also want to add to that Spider six six seven, who says, um, "Could it be possible that things only exist when they're being observed?" And I think in terms of those different levels of reality, perhaps we can play around with both those. So if I could start with you, Brian. start with you, Brian. Yeah, I mean, a definition of reality, it sounds like a simple question. It's a, it's a difficult one. In some sense, reality encompasses all of the qualities of the world that we have access to. I mean, there is a operationalist, positivist view of science, which is the only things that are real are those that you can measure. And from that perspective, you simply have reality is the sum total of all possible measurements that could possibly be carried out at a given moment in time. Now, from that perspective, the second question comes into play because when people talk about things only existing when they're observed, an observation is a measurement. That's really what we mean. And so some people approach quantum mechanics in that guise because quantum mechanics is weird. It says that stuff out there in the world can be in a fuzzy, nebulous haze of many possibilities all at one moment. And only upon measurement is one of those possibilities pulled out of the fuzzy haze and made real. And so it suggests that things only become real in the sense of being measured when an observation takes place. I consider that to be a very bereft view of reality. I consider that to be a very limited view of the world because I'm not just interested in measurements. I'm not just interested in the numbers that come out of a meter or a device or an experimenter's screen when they're looking at something. I believe that there is a real world out there, independent of us, independent of our measurements. And it's my goal to try to understand that world as deeply as possible. And so long before any measurement takes place, long before there's any human being around to take a measurement, I believe there was a world, there was a reality, and it's our goal to understand as deeply as possible. So I consider that positivist operational view to be, yeah, I get it, but it seems to lacking ambition. We have bigger ambitions to understand the stuff that's out there independent of our measurements or existence. Clara, would you like to add? Oh, just uh, it's very interesting what Brian was saying, because I'm a very experimental physicist. So my view is, can I test it? Uh, and if I can't test it, it's really interesting, um, but we can't move forward. But I think both of us need to exist and to work together. And um, so the theoretical and the experimental go hand in hand because we need people to be thinking about how does the universe work on a on a grand scale and uh, what could it possibly look like? And then we need to test each of those uh, proposals and see which ones we can test to be true or which ones we can um 
put to the side. So part of our job also at CERN is to not only discover new particles, but also to to cancel some of the theories to say, I'm sorry that these ones aren't true. Um, so yeah, from my perspective, I'm very experimental, uh, experimentalist, but I also have the same thinking that there is a whole universe out there beyond our measurements, and that is just what it is. And I want to know as much about it as possible through my measurements, but I also accept that there's some stuff I'm just not going to know about yet because we don't have the equipment to measure it properly. But it, it comes down, it's almost a philosophical point, isn't it? Because it comes down to the point of, is physics about, can I predict this? Or is it about, what does it mean? And there, that's, that's, that's fundamentally it. If you can build a perfect model, um, the extension to the standard modeling, predict everything, then there are people who are motivated by that. And they're like, yes, now I've made the perfect machine I can predict. The question of what it means is actually much more difficult. And yeah. is the place where there may be aren't answers, because meaning is a human thing. And you can't do an experiment to find out what something means always. And so then then physics can slide into sort of metaphysics and philosophy. And that's good for humans to think about. But it's a lot harder to see where the lines are. And I think a lot of physicists like to define things. They like to know where the edges are. <laughs> and the problem is that philosophy is really messy. And at some point, what does it mean is a philosophical question. And so these two things have to come together because it's our interpretation. It's about how a human interprets the world which is not just, as Brian said, what is measured. So then it comes down to the definition of what it is to be human. So it all gets very messy. But I think, I, like, I, in my physics degrees, I didn't do any, you know, no one taught me any philosophy or really much of the history of science. And actually, I wish they had, because I learned that all afterwards or on the side. And actually, you don't really understand what you're doing unless you have a bit of that, the, unless you've at least had the philosophical playing field laid out in front of you, even if you don't go and play on it. So, I, yeah, I think... We, empirical empirical science needs to do a bit better at that I think yeah and I think the history of science is really important because you have to understand how these are ideas and how wrong we've been a lot of the time but that doesn't mean that it wasn't an important stepping stone and um, that we had to understand something in one way to then be able to move beyond it and and get a better understanding later and I'm quite happy personally if a lot of the stuff that we've discovered is then found to be slightly incorrect and that there's actually more out there and that we can add on to it because that to me is interesting I want to build on what we've learned and I, I never want us to finish and be like okay we, we know everything about the universe now we can just stop I want us to always keep understanding and and adding to our knowledge well, I reckon there's at least a decade before we know everything about the universe. It might even be longer. Um, the uh, but actually, that's an interesting thing you bring up because that's one that you know. There's that T-shirt which says science doesn't care about your feelings, and I don't like that T-shirt at all because I think it kind of it turns scientists into the idea that there is no emotion in the attachment to ideas, or indeed why sometimes wrong ideas have been argued over. I, I, mm. I can understand the point of that T-shirt in some ways, but I think it makes a rather snotty view of people rising above human emotions. Of, well, we have our machine and it has measured the things. Well, also, history doesn't speak kindly well, to those people because if you think about the Victorian era, you know, 1880s, just around the time, just before x-rays were discovered, perhaps there was some funny stuff going on with light. But basically, but basically the, the attitude of Victorian scientists at that point was, oh, well, we're just tidying up now. Here are things, we've done all the bits, we just need to kind of, you know, polish the edges a bit and then we're done. And... Uh, you know, and then quantum mechanics came along, which is one of the re like, they, like they lived in this deterministic world. Quantum mechanics and relativity come along and they go, oh, oh, that's this is a big mess. This is going to take a while. And and so, so, you know, I'm optimistic, as Clara says, that um, we're not going to have finished tidying up for a long time yet. And how yeah. boring <laughs> would it be? You know, so so there's a fate, I think it's Dara O'Brien has said this many times that scientists know they don't know everything because otherwise they would stop. <laughs> yeah I think uh so the that came out from LHCB about a week and a half ago so just in case anybody hasn't heard of them so this is a measurement that um took place by the LHCB experiment at CERN and they uh measured the amount so they were trying to measure from B quarks going to strange quarks and pairs of charged leptons and they wanted to see whether or not it was the same rate for both electrons and muons. And they found that there were fewer muons being measured uh, than they expected. And this isn't 
what is predicted by the standard model. And the phrase that you'll hear so many scientists saying about this measurement is cautiously excited. Because if it's true, if it is something else happening within this measurement, then that's something, as I was saying earlier, that we can add on top of the standard model. It's a whole new type of particle or a force that we can investigate. And it's really interesting. But we don't want to necessarily let our emotions of we really want there to be something else to get in the in the way of the science. So it has to be a balance of the that we're pushing and striving um, to find out more about the universe, but we we can't put our hopes into it too much because we don't want to affect the results. So cautiously excited is the the phrase about that measurement because we have to wait for more data before we can say whether or not it's true. Always waiting for the data. The uh, I should mention by the way that Brian is extremely good i think on this uh, until the end of time uh, and i will also recommend the, another some person i did tips for existence with the other week carlo Ravelli's book helgoland is another book which i think very much attaches senses of what it means to be human in the changing realities that we're beginning to understand so put both of those on your on your book list now steve thompson who is uh, a fantastic musician who we work a lot with in the christmas shows and others and some may know him as a laser harpist uh, he is a magnificent laser it's a very beautiful way to open a show with a laser laser harp uh which he has to play very quickly with gloved hands because in a big room it really does burn um he has a genuine question he says is it possible to levitate a tiny diamond or something with a similar refractive index with a laser i've been trying for two years now and can't do it i saw it done online am i being hoaxed so i'll start with you brian is steve jazz musician steve being hoaxed with his lasers i have absolutely no idea this is one that I didn't know who to throw to first. So this is going to be this is basically our olive oil and walnut oil <laughs> question for the day. Um, Helen, what do you reckon? Well, well, I I think anything you can see is unlikely to be levitated by a laser that you can be in the same room as. Um, so so as a practical experiment, you can do at home. I think that's very unlikely. Uh, if you want to go levitating things, I'd try getting some acoustics and a frog. Um, mm -hmm. far more likely to succeed and apparently the frogs don't mind but don't tell the RSPTA I said that um, so I would tend towards the no in principle I think it's on a tiny scale you can you know there are ways to manipulate matter with light but I don't think it's anything you could do in your garage Clara, also diamonds really are really dense so as Helen was just saying I, I can't imagine a laser that could levitate them that wouldn't just destroy a lot of things <laughs> But it's creating, a, I mean, for anyone who's thinking about going into jazz, what you've just heard is a jazz musician whose house is filled with lasers and tiny diamonds, which mm -hmm. is suggesting there's a lot of money in it, which great is great. News. I'd uh, like to see that film. <laughs> we have, uh, that's another thing we'll make. Do you know what? If the lockdown continues, we've got time to make films about lasers and diamonds. Uh, now, this is a question from James. James says, does quantum physics ever practically come into play in in inverted commas here, real world physics, like what Helen does and how much useful real world physics or even Newtonian physics is used when dealing with research into things like black holes, superstrings and quarks. So that's an interesting bit where, where those two worlds meet. Brian? Yeah, I mean, it certainly does. It certainly We're does. Right. We're right now at one of the most fruitful periods in theoretical research where we're trying to put together our understanding of black holes, one of the examples given in the question, with quantum mechanics. So right now, the big issues are the things that we have learned in the quantum world, such as quantum entanglement, that two distant particles can somehow be connected by what appears to be a thread of quantum connection called quantum entanglement. Does that persist when those two particles are on opposite sides of the event horizon of a black hole? And if it does persist, what does that mean for the processes that Stephen Hawking taught us about where particles can ooze from the event horizon, so-called Hawking radiation. So, so the ideas of quantum mechanics might seem to be cordoned off into a realm that's so tiny that maybe it feels like it wouldn't have any direct relevance to the physics of things that we can see and observe and measure in more ordinary ways, but that's just not the case. Quantum mechanics, the laws of the small, relativity, laws of the big, we are deeply enmeshed in trying to bring those together into some unified perspective that will allow us to understand exotic structures from the Big Bang to black holes. I feel so 
I can't just spot it next to me, but um, Jim Al-Khalidi wrote a book called Life on the Edge, all about quantum biology, basically, and about the possibility that quantum effects actually are important in the biological world because cells, you know, cells and the things inside cells are maybe starting to operate on those kind of scales. So that might be a good place to look. Brilliant. Uh, this is from Narelle. Narelle uh, says, I'm not sure if this sounds like a semantic sort of question, but if everything tends towards disorder with entropy, how do new stars and planets form? Um, and I suppose I'll go to you, Brian, because just, you do talk about that in, in your most recent book. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, a deep and vital question because deep and vital question because the so-called second law of thermodynamics, which underlies the question, tells us that entropy disorder overwhelmingly tends to increase over time. So a natural question is if disorder grows over time, how do you get ordered structures to ever form like planets and stars and people? And it's a question that we understand the answer to quite well. It's a process that I gave a name that isn't widely used, but I think it's evocative. I call this the entropic two-step. What I mean by that is there's a kind of entropic dance that happens in the universe where Entropy can go down in a pocket, in a region. Disorder can go down so long as in the process, enough disorder is ejected to the wider environment so that overall, the net is an increase in entropy, a net increase in disorder. So when a star forms, gravity is pulling matter together. It's making an orderly object, but when you study the process in detail, enough heat and light is always emitted in the process such that entropy was carried away by that heat and light to the wider environment. So overall, entropy goes up, even though stars and planets and people can form. And, and we are ourselves structures that dance this entropic two-step as long as we live. We take in material from the environment, we burn it in order to have the fuel to power bodily functions, and we constantly emit heat and waste to the environment to keep our order intact at the expense of an environment that soaks up the disorder overall entropy goes up even though we persist for a period of time in an orderly state brilliant Sorry, this you, from Brian. astrogate has just come in uh, would breaking the standard model break some limits we think are non-breakable right now such as plank limits um so we don't we don't know yet um but i i think i mean the standard model is very uh, robust so when I say that we break it, what I mean is that we find something beyond it. We're, we're either trying to, to prove it wrong or we're trying to find something that isn't explained in the standard model that that would then have to be explained by something else. So we're not, currently we've not broken the standard model and it, it, it's very much uh, every prediction that we've had from it, we've been able to to measure at the, the LHC and at other experiments around the world. Um, so really when yeah, with the LHCB result that comes out that could be true, could not be true. It's uh, It's got a one in a thousand chance at the moment that it is just a statistical fluctuation, which sounds like it's very a very robust result, but uh, we do thousands of experiments at CERN all the time. And so you can have this chance uh, events happening um, just purely by the fact that we're doing so many measurements. Um, so in this case, it wouldn't be breaking the standard model. It would be adding on top of it, and um, and we would have to think of something else. But yeah, getting to the Planck scale is something that we're not really able to do right now. We'd need a much bigger particle accelerator, but really not even one that you could have on this planet. You would have to have something galactic. And, and something I really uh, love hearing about that is completely sci-fi is just that s some of these... Uh, events happening in the universe uh, could be other civilizations, their particle accelerators. Um, but that is just completely, we have no idea, so please don't email me about aliens. But just the idea that if you wanted to, to probe at such scales, you really would need something uh, much, much bigger to be able to, to do those kind of measurements. Brilliant. Thank you. This is from Vincent, Brian, for you, Brian, which, for you is, which is uh, really him just asking about calling gravity a force uh, when uh, it's just the you know, curvature of space time. So I suppose, that, again, it's almost is to some extent semantics, isn't it? Uh, how, how do we divide you know, the idea? I, th I think the uh, Faye Dowker always has that wonderful thing where we think of gravity as pushing us down. But if you really f if you sit in your chair, you can almost feel as if you're being being pushed upwards rather than be being forced down. How do we deal with that kind of the change of understanding of gravity and then placing it within the four forces? 
Yeah. Yeah, it really does depend on on a perspective. I still think of gravity as a force of nature. Einstein did give us another way of thinking about it, where we imagine that objects are just meandering along the chutes and valleys in a curved space-time environment like a child who's going down a slide that has all sorts of twists and turns in it. And from that perspective, gravity is not so much a force as the questioner is saying, but rather it is the curvature of space-time and we simply follow the folds. So, so that's a fine way of thinking about things. But you know, when I hold this, this cup right here, I feel that force of gravity pulling it downward. So I naturally use that language. I can switch perspectives and think about Earth warping the space-time environment and my mug wanting to slide down the indentation in the space-time environment. I can use that language too. So language is most useful in a given circumstance as that gives you a greater power to understand things in the world around you. So Pretty. something something that could help us understand the difference between the two is a lot of, so the other forces have propagators. Um, and so if gravity is a force, it could have some force that we call a graviton, but it's not something that we've ever measured. So if, if we could find a situation where we could measure a graviton, then that would give us a better understanding of, of gravity. But at the moment, that's not something that we, we've measured at CERN. But it's also the case that you use different models for different to answer different questions. And that if you are a high school physics student who wants to know how fast the block is sliding down, the general relativity isn't going to help you. So it's not that one is wrong or right, mm -hmm. it's that you use the tool that's appropriate for the job. Yeah, absolutely. And I think people get very sort of snooty sometimes about some descriptions um, because they go, oh, well, it's wrong. And you're like, well, obviously, all of it's wrong if you really want to ask, right? They're all just human inventions that we're laying on top to try and explain. So don't get snobbish about it because, you know, they'll, they'll all probably change a bit in the future. So I think you use the tool that is most appropriate for the job and, and everyone can stop being snobbish about it. Pretty. And, and no, maybe just... one addendum, Robin, if you have a moment. Robin. To if you have a moment to the comment that you referenced about Faye mentioning, you know, when you think about the apocryphal story or not of Newton getting hit on the head by the apple, in the general relativistic Einsteinian version of it, it's the apple's perspective that's the special one. And therefore, from the apple's perspective, there's this head that rushes up and slams into it. And so it's not that the apple fell on Newton's head. It's that Newton's head rushed up and smashed the apple. So, you know, it is a perspectival issue. I love the idea of turning uh, Newton into this vicious <laughs> apples, <laughs> rooting around space time. Well, he, he doesn't sound like he <laughs> was filled feel with joie de vivre from what I've read about him anyway. Um, just quickly mentioned, by the way, near the beginning, we talked about hy hyperdimensional uh, objects. And uh, Trent, our producer, made a film with uh, Matt Parker, who you will probably all know, a stand-up mathematician, uh, about trying to make hyperdimensional objects using 3D printing. And you yeah, can find that on his stand-up maths channel. So go and look at that. And I'll quickly, before we get to our final questions, mention uh, that, uh, as I mentioned before, next week we'll be doing dinosaurs uh, with uh, Susie Maidman. And Helen, you're with us next week, aren't you? You've got a week off coming up, but you are with us next week. So any questions about dinosaurs, join us uh, for that. Send us your questions now. And also this week's Uncanny Hour is about Exorcist 3, which is an amazing film uh, by William Peter Blatty. And we have Mark Kermode and Mark Gatiss and Reese Shearsmith and others talking about that. And also at the end of the book has a theory about the Big Bang. It's not a very scientific theory, but it is a fantastic biblical theory about the Big Bang. So we'll probably be talking about that as well. But that's uh, the uh, upcoming Uncanny Hour episode. And then the next Tips for Existence is uh, um, Neil Gaiman. And as I said, you can also uh, hear Brian was the first uh, guest that we had on Tips for Existence. And uh, Carla Ravelli was a uh, recent one. Sarah Parkak, Nicole Stott, and uh, and others, Francesca Stavrokopoulou as well. Uh, now, we've got a bubble question. So that's for you, Helen, uh, because the final question I've got ends with discuss. So we'll definitely end on the discuss one. Uh, but Zara, first of all, would like to know, could a bubble theoretically be infinite? as in never pop, underwater perhaps, or is the physical structure always finitely fragile? Okay, so a bubble, there are two ways of defining a bubble. Well, there's, there's one that sort of merges into two, and it is a pocket of gas that is surrounded by liquid. That's what a bubble is. And in the case of a soap bubble, there's a whole lot of air around the outside of that as well. So in principle, if you put a soap bubble or an underwater bubble in the International Space Station, for example, it could exist 
continuously without popping because as long as the water didn't evaporate up if it's a soap bubble or as long as the gas didn't dissolve into the water uh, and there's ways to make both of those things happen then there's no reason for anything to change so in that case it could persist um, and as long, gravity actually doesn't do very doesn't help with bubbles very much it tends to drain things and then they pop and evaporation doesn't help but there's no reason a bubble couldn't just carry on exist as a little sphere in a perfectly saturated environment so it's perfectly possible it's just quite a lot of effort when so it's so easy to make another one well we'll end on that we've only got 30, 30 seconds, seconds for our discuss but we'll give it a go this is from ferraro who says this is the headline that greeted me on the home page of reddit at lunchtime today scientists directly manipulated antimatter with a laser in mind-blowing thirst please discuss yeah they did <laughs> So very quickly, it's an experiment, experiment. Uh, where they took um, anti-protons and added uh, positrons to make anti-hydrogen. And you can trap this in a, in a cage. Uh, and you have to be very careful because if it touches any of the sides, then it annihilates. Uh, and what and it was goes back to a bit what I was talking about earlier. We want to know if it how it reacts with gravity. And um, atoms, when they have temperature, they move around quite a lot. So you then get a blurry measurement because you don't just get the gravity result, you get the kinetic energy of them moving around. So if you fire a laser that has um, the energy slightly below the excitation energy uh, for the uh, anti-hydrogen, then it uses some of that kinetic energy to add to the laser energy, and so it slows it down. And so they cooled down the anti-hydrogen in preparation to be able to measure it when we restart later in the year uh, with gravity. So we did it. Well, that's a pretty good discuss. Uh, uh, anyone, uh, anyone else want to add anything there or? No, I reckon we got there. So uh, thanks very much for joining us. As I said, Dinosaurs next week. Uh, Until the End of Time is now out in paperback. And uh, as I said, it's a fantastic book. And uh, join us. We've got Book Shambles next week. And we've got uh, Uncanny Hour and also an anthology version of Tips for Existence as well. Uh, thank you very much, Brian. Thank you very much, Clara. Okay. Thank you very much, Helen. And enjoy the rest of your Sunday. I hope wherever you are, it is as uh, sunny as it is where I am, which has probably been pouring in because the blind's broken, hence my strange... I'm not deliberately having a load of sun on me to try and bleach out my features because I realised how badly I've aged. Just so you know, some of us have been hit by entropy harder than others. Enjoy your weekend. <laughs>